Howdy! Welcome to Elementary Statistics. My name is Lance Curtis and this is the lecture for Section 1-3, Collecting Sample Data. In this lecture, we're going to cover the basics of data collection, get into descriptions of some sampling methods, look at statistical study designs, and then finish the lecture with a discussion on experimental error. Sounds exciting, right? Ooh, yeah! Let's get into it. The key concepts in this section or what you see here on the screen. Few and far between, but they're actually very powerful concepts. The method used to collect sample data influences the quality of the statistical analysis. I cannot overemphasize this. Garbage in, garbage out. That's what this is. So if you want a good study, you've got to have good data. Now, the way you get good data, in part, is with an appropriate data collection method. You've got to look at how you sample your data. That's going to determine, in large measure, whether you have good data or poor data. Sometimes your data collection method can be so poor that the data that it produces just becomes completely useless. And there's no way that you could, you know, manipulate or torture your numbers into uh, a data set that will give you at least a halfway decent study or analysis. It's, it's not the way it works. Okay, You've got to have good data from the start. And of particular importance among the different sampling methods is the simple random sample. We'll discuss more of what this means in a moment. But first we need to talk about the basics of data collection. So the data that we collect and how we collect it will determine what statistical methods we use to analyze the data. Typically, there are two distinct sources for obtaining data. The first is from what's called an observational study. The second is what's called an experiment. Let's take a closer look at each of these two data sources. So first up, we have the observational study. In an observational study, you're simply just sitting there, you're making an observation, hence the name observational study. Okay? You're not making any attempt to modify the subject being studied. You're not making any attempt to see, okay, what if we tinker with this or push this button or pull this lever to see what happens then. No, no. You're just sitting back and you're just observing and saying, this is what is. So you're making a measurement. You're, you're, you're recording an observation of some quality or category that you see. That's an observational study. The example given here on the slide, the Pew Research Center surveyed 2,252 adults and found that 59% of them go online wirelessly. This is an observational study, okay, because you're not, you're not trying to manipulate people into whether or not they go online or not. You're just looking at, uh, you know, you're just looking at what's actually there. What is there? So you're just sitting back and making an observation. That's very different from an experiment, because an experiment you are making some treatment to the to the subjects and then observing the effects that that treatment has on the subjects. The subjects and experiments are sometimes called experimental units. <laughs> I just gotta, I mean, okay, oh, okay, this is one of the things in statistics. Okay, statisticians are not normal people. Let me say it again: statisticians are not normal people because they have vocabulary to describe everything and sometimes the vocabulary that they use makes them sound a little strange and sometimes more than a little strange and, and this is I would say one example of that experimental units I mean think about that <laughs> experimental units <laughs> my mind instantly goes to the Borg we are the Borg resistance is futile we will assimilate you into our culture your distinctiveness will be added to our own I mean, that sort of thing, you know, it's just experimental units. Wow. And then I think about all the conversations I've had with workmates in corporate America about uh, life in life in Cubeville, where, you know, everyone's in their own little cubicle and you're supposed to be in this, you know, little box and that's supposed to lead to career greatness where you're working in this little box. Uh, yeah, experimental units. It's just, it's just one of those. Anyway, here's an example of an experiment. In 1954, we had the largest public health experiment ever conducted by Dr. Jonas Salk 
it was part of the development of the polio vaccine. Now, we don't think much about polio today because um, it's pretty much been eradicated. And you still find little pockets of it here and there in the third world. But, you know, for for much of the world, polio has basically been conquered. And that's something that happened, you know, fairly recently in terms of world history standards. So in 1954, there was this huge public health experiment. And in the experiment, you can see from the numbers here, there were a lot of kids involved in this. 2,745 were given the vaccine. And then 2,001, 229 children were given the placebo. So this really involved a lot of testing. I mean, no one's going to argue sample size here, right? So because the, the injections of the vaccine are constituting a treatment. So we're going to give one, you know, one group one thing, and then we're going to give another group another thing, and we're going to look for the difference between them, then that's constituting an experiment. So now let's go through some examples to see whether we're looking at an observational study or an experiment. First example, a research company wants to study reactions to stress so it surveys people in which the questioner pretends to get angry with responses. That's going to be a really interesting. I, I'd, I'd pay money to watch that, especially to see some of the responses from some of the, from the uh, participants of the study. But anyway, I digress. So is this an example of an observational study or an experiment? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, this is an example of an experiment. Okay, the pretend anger is to see, okay, what what you gonna do? Okay, it's gonna be one way or the other. It's a type of treatment. You're trying to influence the response that's given. So therefore, because of that attempt to influence, this is an example of an experiment. Here's a second example. Professional touch therapists were tested by holding one hand above one of the therapist's hands opposite a cardboard partition. So in essence, what you have is the participant basically puts hands through a hole that's in a piece of cardboard so you can't see, you know, which hand is which. And then uh, someone on the other end puts puts their hand above the left hand or the right hand, and the therapist who can't see, you know, which hand is over the hands that are through the cardboard, you know, has to say, okay, you're holding it over the left hand or the, or the right hand. Is this an example of an experiment or an observational study? Okay, this is an example of an observational study, okay? Here in this instance, there is no attempt to influence the response that's given, okay? You can't see which hand is, is, is being held over the hands that are opposite the cardboard partition. You can't, you can't see that. So the response is simply a measurement of what is, and that makes this an observational study. Here's the next example. A clinical trial of a drug among 188 subjects found 3.7% experienced nausea. Is this an observational study or an experiment? Well, I hope you said experiment because that's what this is. Clinical trial of a drug so you're, you're giving them some type of treatment, and presumably there are people who don't get the treatment, and so you're going to compare the uh, results you get from the two groups, and that's going to make this an experiment. We need to talk a little bit about study design selection. Okay, So suppose there's a group that wants to conduct a study to determine whether fruit consumption leads to reduced weight. Would an observational study or an experiment be better, and why? Based on what we've learned so far, 
What would you say? I'll give you a few seconds to determine your answer. So here in this instance, an experiment would be better. So now that we know an experiment would be better, the next question is why? Why would an experiment be better? Again, I'll give you a few seconds to think about this. And make sure you make a response. Okay, here we want an experiment. Okay, if we did an observational study, then all we would do is just look at two variables, okay, fruit consumption and weight change. And we're not going to make any attempt to modify or influence the subjects. But there are plenty of variables that could influence weight, as many of us all well know, okay? So you've got to look at not just fruit consumption, but the whole diet of the participants. I mean, it doesn't matter how many apples and oranges you eat. If, you know, you've you got like, you know, 50 grams of sugar you're inputting every day, uh, it's, I mean, that's, the fruit consumption is going to be a small part of the, of the uh, weight change in that instance. Exercise levels, hormone levels, the age of the participants, I mean, all this stuff plays in. So, you really want to look at the effect of different variables, then you're really looking at an experiment. In addition, experiment could also examine a control and treatment group representing different levels of fruit consumption and also be designed to minimize the effects of these other variables. So we don't want to just observe what's there. We want to actually introduce some type of treatment to see what difference the treatment makes. In this case, the, the treatment is the level of fruit consumption. Let's talk for a moment now about sampling methods. Okay, we know that we're going to take a sample and then we're going to take data from that sample and then use that data to make inferences and conclusions about the whole population. Okay, the way we do that is with the method of sampling. Okay, we need to sample the population in such a way that that portion we take out has characteristics that are similar to the population as a whole. There are different ways that we can go about achieving this. So amongst the several types of sampling methods, we have random, systematic, convenience, stratified, cluster, and multi-stage methods of sampling. Let's take a look at each one of these individually. First up, we have random sampling. So in a random sample, Members from the population are selected such that each individual member has the same chance of being selected. So here in the graphic that you see, you've got people that are numbered 1 through 12, and we pick out number 2, number 5, number 8, number 10. Well, number 2 has the same chance of being selected as number 8 and the same chance of being selected as number five, and the same chance of being selected as number nine, or number 12, or number one, they all have an equal chance of being selected. And that makes this sample random. Now there's a special type of the random sample called the simple random sample. This is a, subject of, a sample of in subjects selected so that every possible sample of the same size has the same chance of being chosen. So we could say that we selected 2, 5, 8, and 10 from our list of participants numbered 1 through 12. That is a random sample, as you see here. But in order to be a simple random sample, we'd have to say that every possible sample of four participants has the same chance of being chosen. So it's not just each individual member, but it's each set of the same number that has the same chance of being chosen. That makes this a simple random sample. So if the sample were taken by sets of four, 
with each possible set having an equal chance of being selected, we would have a simple random sample. Let's turn through a quick exercise to help us integrate this concept of simple random samples. So I'm going to give you some examples and you're going to determine whether each of the following examples are simple random samples. And then also be sure to note, to note why or why not. So here's the first example. To test for a gender gap in the way people purchase cars, a company randomly selects exactly 750 adult men and 750 adult women to poll. Is this an example of a simple random sample and why or why not? I'll give you a few seconds. Okay, here this is not a case of a simple random sample. Okay, you've got 750 adult men and 750 adult women. So that's a total sampling of 750 plus 750, which makes 1,500. But not every sample of 1,500 has the same chance of being selected because half of them are men and half of them are women. There are plenty of uh, possibilities to take 1,500 subjects to sample, but you're not going to get half and half of the genders. So not every sample of 1,500 has the same chance of being selected. Therefore, this is not a simple random sample. However, it still could be a random sample if you're selecting the men randomly and the women randomly. That, that could still be a random sample, but it's not going to be a simple random sample. Here's the next example. You plan to conduct a post-election survey of the 312 voters who voted in a given county in the last election by using a computer to randomly select 200 of them. Is this an example of a simple random sample? Why or why not? I'll give you a moment. So here we have, yes, an example of a simple random sample. There's 200 in the sample, so that's 200 for the sample size, and every sample of 200 has the same chance of being selected. Every way that you could take 200 people from the total of 312, they have an equal chance of being selected. So this is an example of a simple random sample. Here's the next example. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration conducts crash tests of cars by randomly selecting one car of each different model. Is this an example of a simple random sample? Okay, just like the first example that we saw, this is not an example of a simple random sample. Okay, so you're going to take a sample, conduct crash test of cars by random selecting one car from each different model. So the selection from each model is random, but the sample size, whatever the sample size is, so let's say you're going to test, say, four different models. Well, let's say the four models are a Toyota, a Subaru, a Ford, and a Chevy. So you could take one car randomly from each of those four models, and that represents a sample size of four, but not every sample of four from all those lists of models of cars has the same chance of being selected, because you're only selecting one from each type. So you could have a sample of four if you had, say, two Toyotas, a Subaru, and a Ford. There wouldn't be a Chevy in the mix, but you'd still have four cars. That's a possibility. So not all of the possible combinations of four cars have the same chance of being selected. So therefore, this is not an example of a simple random sample. 
Let's talk for a moment now about systematic sampling. So in systematic sampling, you take your sample from every kth element of the population. So you're only going to, like, you go like every so often. So here we have an example where we're taking every third unit, starting with number two. So our 12 people, again numbered 1 through 12. So we're going to start with number 2. We take him first. And then you count 3, 3 after that. So from 2, you count 1, 2, 3. So then we're going to take that one. Then you take 1, 2, 3, take that one. 1, 2, 3, take that one. And that's the way you do systematic sampling. It's it's every kth element or every kth unit from the, then that's what, from the population. And that's what determines your sample. Next up, we have convenience sampling. Convenience sampling is so-called because you're taking your sample from whatever's easy or convenient to obtain. And usually it's just, you know, what's right next to you. So here in the graphic below, we're looking at the sample. It's a convenient sample because the researcher, who's marked there in red in the middle, is only looking at the people that are directly around him or her. So because you're just taking what's convenient. That's what's called a convenient sample. Now, the problem with convenient sampling is, as you will notice, look at we have a blue person, a green person, a green person, and a green person. But there's plenty of people in the population who are purple, and they're not represented in our sample. And this is the problem with convenient sampling, because oftentimes what you'll get with a convenient sample is a sample that's not representative of the whole population. And remember, in order for us to use the methods of statistics to make inferences of the population from just a small sample, we have to have that sample be representative of the population. Well, that's the problem with convenient sampling is that oftentimes you get a sample that's not representative, and so it can lead you to erroneous conclusions when you do your statistical analysis. So try to avoid convenient sampling if at all possible. Next up we have stratified sampling. So in stratified sampling you simply have the population divided into two or more subgroups and then uh, you're basically randomly selecting from each of those subgroups. So here you've got blue people here on top and then you've got red people here in the middle and then you've got green people here and we're going to take four people. So one from the blues, two from the reds, because they're twice as big as the blue or the greens, and then one from the green. So that gives a stratified sample. And, and that's, the, that's where the name comes from, is because, you know, each of these different groups represents stratum. Okay, like you would see, like, layers of, you know, material that are embedded in, in rock in the earth. Okay, uh, over time, you can see different layers uh, that are markers of geological time. They're called strata. And that's where this name comes from, because each of these different groups represents each of those different levels, so to speak. And so that's where a stratified sampling comes from. Cluster sampling is where you divide the population into sections, okay, which are called clusters. And then you take, randomly select the clusters. But, with, but in order to be cluster sampling, you have to take everything in the cluster. So here we've got our 12 people numbered 1 through 12 and we're dividing them up into six different groups. So each of these different groups is a cluster. So we've got six clusters here for our 12 people and we want a sample size of four people. So that means we need to take two clusters. So we randomly select this cluster here with 5 and 6 and this cluster here with 11 and 12 and so we put that together. That gives us our sample of four people. Notice that we took the entirety of the groups. It's not like we say, okay, we're going to randomly select this cluster, but then only pick one person from the cluster. No, no, we have to take everything in the cluster. So we randomly pick this, this cluster. That means we're going to take both these people. Or randomly select this cluster. We're going to take both these people. There's our sample size of four, and that is cluster sampling. Multi-stage sampling basically means you're taking data in stages, but in each of these stages you could use a different method of, of sampling. So a good example of multi-stage sampling would be 
yeah, you're, you're conducting an in-home survey where surveys are going out face-to-face -face and talking to people, and the workers are basically sampling according to three different stages. So in the first stage, you conduct systematic sampling of areas within a region. And then the second stage is you do cluster sampling of households within those areas. The third stage could then involve random sampling of one person in each household. So in systematic sampling, remember that we're actually taking every, it's like every so often unit that we're taking. So that's like dividing a region up into different areas and then saying, okay, we're going to number them one through whatever. And then we're just going to take, say, like every third one or every fourth one or every, you know, tenth one or whatever it is. Okay. Then from those areas that we take, we're going to do cluster sampling. So each of those areas is divided into clusters. And then uh, each of those clusters will have a certain number of households in them. So we're going to randomly select clusters from each of the different areas. But for each cluster that we take, we're going to take all the houses within that area. And then the third stage is where we go to, when we go to each house, we're going to randomly sample one person in that household. This is an example of multi-stage sampling because at each stage of the, of the sampling method to get to the final part where we're collecting data, we're engaging a different sampling method. So now we're going to play a game called Name the Sampling Method. So I'm going to give you an example and you're going to identify what sampling method is used uh, for, for each of the following examples. So the first one up is randomly selecting 12 different pages from a book and then counting the number of words in each sentence on those pages. I'll give you a few seconds to determine your answer. Okay, well, I hope you said cluster sampling because that's what this is. So each page in the book represents a different group from which we can select. Okay, those different groups are clusters, but then once we select those pages randomly, so we've got 12 of them we select randomly, then everything within that grouping is, is then taken to become part of our data set. So counting the number of words on each sentence on those pages, that's taking everything that's on the page. And so this is an example of cluster sampling, randomly selecting from the clusters and then taking everything inside each cluster we randomly select. Here's the next example. 1,007 adults were called after a computer randomly generated their numbers. I'll give you a few seconds. Well, I hope you said random sampling because that's what this is. Computer randomly generating their numbers, and that's what you go with. So that's a clear case of random sampling. Here we have the next example. Researchers sampled from different locations in a lake by stretching a rope across a lake and sampling at every five meters. I'll give you a few seconds. If you said systematic sampling, then you're right. So we're taking samples not from every location across the lake, but every so often. So you take five meters, take a sample. Go another five meters, take another sample. Go another five meters, take another sample. So you're doing it every so often at a regular interval across the distance. That's systematic sampling. Here's our next example. CBS News in New York City often obtains opinions by interviewing neighbors of someone who is the focus of their story. What sampling method does this describe? Again, I'll give you a moment. Here we have an example of a convenience sampling. So you're not really, there's no randomization to it. You're just taking what's conveniently available to you. So you're, you're obviously going to talk about the focus of the story, 
But then it's really convenient to say, okay, the guy lives here, so let's talk to all his neighbors who live right next door. That's an example of convenience sampling. You're taking what's readily available in front of you. So last example to look at, specific polling stations are randomly selected and everyone leaving those polling stations are surveyed. Okay, here you have another example of cluster sampling. So you're randomly selecting the polling station. So each polling station represents a different group or a different cluster. And then you take everything in the ones that you randomly select. So for those polling stations that you randomly select, you're taking everyone that leaves those polling stations, you're surveying them. That's an example of cluster sampling. All right, so now let's go beyond the basics of data collection by looking at more than just the sampling methods. It's not the only way to, I mean, yes, you want to pay attention to the sampling methods because it's a primary way by which we influence the quality of our data. But how we design our statistical study also exerts a large influence on the goodness of our study. There's different types of observational studies. First, we have cross-sectional studies, retrospective studies, and then perspective studies. And then we also have different types of experiments, or, or what's called experimental designs. So we could have randomization, we could have replication, we could also have blinding. Let's talk about each of these uh, in more detail and order. So first up, we have cross-sectional studies. In a cross-sectional study, you're observing data, you're making measurements, you're collecting things one point at a time. So you have, for example, here, as you see in the, in the graphic, you've got three different groups that you're looking at. You're comparing them at one point in time. An example of a cross-sectional study would be a survey of risk factors between smokers and non-smokers during a specific year. So you've got two different groups, smokers and the non-smokers, and you're looking at the differences between those groups at a specific point in time during a specific year. Another example would be comparing the reading abilities of sixth graders in poor middle class and wealthy income backgrounds. So each of the income backgrounds represents a different grouping and then you compare the reading abilities at the same time. You're looking at what they were for these different groups in the sixth grade. Another type of observational study we could conduct is a retrospective study. Okay, so in a retrospective study, as the name implies, you're actually being retrospective. You're looking to the past. You're going back in time to collect your data. And for this reason, uh, retrospective studies are also called case control studies or case studies because you have a certain case that's documented and you're going back to the documentation of what happened to conduct your study. An example of a retrospective study would be an investigation into whether the chemicals used in tire manufacturing increases the risk of death. And, you know, believe me, if you're working in a tire manufacturing plant, that study would be of particular interest to you. Well, how do you actually study that retrospectively? Well, you can go back in the past and look at, okay, let's look at employee records to determine who had what exposure, and then we could compare that list of employees with public death records to determine which of them actually died. That's one way you could conduct such a study like this. And looking back at those past records, it makes this a retrospective study because you're looking at the past. In contrast, perspective studies are oriented toward the future from groups that share common factors. And these common factors are called cohorts. For this reason, Prospective studies are also called longitudinal studies because often they take a long time to complete. They're also called cohort studies because you're studying groups that share common factors called cohorts. So an example of a prospective study would be an investigation of the relationship between obesity and heart attack rate in women over the next 10 years. So it's prospective because you're looking ahead to the future 
And the way you would conduct a study is you, you enroll your participants in the study, you collect data on where they are today, and then you follow up with more data collection in the future. So let's say next year you come back and you collect the same type of data. And the year after that, you come back and collect the same data. And you do that over the next 10 years. So it's a perspective study because you're constantly looking towards the future to collect more data. So having gone through the different types of observational studies, let's see what we've learned. I'm going to give you an example, and yours left to identify the type of observational study in the example. So first up, we have this example. The nurse's health study began in 1976 with 121,700 female registered nurses between 30 and 55 years old. Subjects were surveyed in 1976 and every two years thereafter. It still continues today. What type of observational study is this? I'll give you a few seconds to determine. Well, I hope you said perspective study, because that's exactly what this is. So you start, even though the, the, the study is starting in the past, and 1976 is well in the past, I understand that. But you're starting in a certain year, and, and you're coming back every year. So the data collection is happening in, is, you're always looking to the future to collect more data. That's what you got to focus on. It's like, where are you collecting your data? The data here is being collected. You're always looking to the future to collect more and more data. So that makes this a prospective study. Here's the next example. Researchers investigating drinking and driving obtained records of past car crashes and partitioned subjects into groups based on evidence of alcohol consumption. So what type of observational study does this represent? I'll give you a moment to determine. Here we have an example of a retrospective study. Okay, Where are you looking to get your data? You're looking to the past. You're looking to records of what happened in the past to collect your data. And so therefore, that makes this a retrospective study. Here's the next example. Researchers from the National Institutes of Health survey 500 adults of each gender to determine the current rates of smoking among adult males and females. Again, I'll give you a moment to determine what type of observational study we have here. Well, I hope you said cross-sectional study because that's exactly what this is. So where are you looking to get the data? Okay. You're actually surveying adults in the present, okay? So because you're looking to the present to collect your data, that makes this a cross-sectional study. Let's talk for a moment about <clears throat> experimental designs. So first up, we have randomization. So a randomized design exists when you assign subjects randomly to different groups. The idea here is to use chance as a way to create groups that are similar. So here you've got uh, examples of two populations. So you've got your, your people numbered 1 through 12. And, you know, we randomly select uh, the second, the fifth, the eighth, and the tenth person from the group. And it's looking at a second population. You know, you're, you're randomly selecting. Here you've got the same numbers being selected. But the idea is that you end up with, samples that have similar characteristics. So if you look at in each sample of four people, so you've got the same size, and then look at the constituency of the sample. So you've got two red people, one green person, and one blue person. And that's what you see in each of the different samples. So that's that's the thing to focus in on, not necessarily the numbers, 
the actual specific individuals that were chosen. You're looking at the characteristics. So, you know, you could easily have randomly picked, you know, 4, 7, 12, and 9 from the second group. You'd still have two reds, one green, and one blue. And that's the thing that you're looking at. You're using chance to create groups that are similar to each other in their, in their characteristics. Next up is replication. So when you have a replicated design, that means you're repeating the experiment on more than just one subject. And replication is most effectively used when there are enough subjects to recognize the differences from different treatments. So if you're just looking at two people, well, that's hardly enough, you know, subjects to recognize differences between different treatments, okay? Um, small samples tend to behave erratically in statistical studies. And that erratic behavior tends to disguise the effects of different treatments. So you, what you want to do is ensure that your samples are large enough to reveal the true nature of any effects that your treatment is giving or influ influencing. Also, you want to make sure your sample is obtained using appropriate methods. So, yes, you want to replicate the experiment on more than one subject, but you want to make sure that those subjects that you choose are chosen through an appropriate method, such as random sampling. And then, of course, there's blinding. Blinding occurs when the subject uh, under the experiment does not know whether he or she is receiving a treatment or a placebo. Blinding is very useful because it allows us to determine whether the effect from a treatment is significantly different from a placebo effect. Um, and that placebo effect is something that occurs when an untreated subject reports improvement in symptoms. So you took a sugar pill and you're like, wow, I don't feel any pain. Thanks a lot, doc. Uh, that's what we would call a placebo effect. Blinding can occur at two different levels. The first level is where the subject doesn't know whether he or she is receiving a treatment or a placebo. And the second level is where the experimenter, the person dispensing the treatment, doesn't know whether he or she is administering a treatment or a placebo. So when you're blind on both of these levels, that's where you get what's called a double blind study. And I'm sure a lot of a lot of people have heard the term double blind study. And a lot of, of experimental design strive to get double blinded. Because reduces the possibility of uh, some type of uh, in influence outside of the study influencing the results. So you really want to shoot for double-blind uh, experimental design, if at all possible, because it allows us to recognize what differences are truly significant uh, between the different uh, groups in the study. Something to keep in mind when designing your experiments is an aspect called confounding. This occurs in an experiment when who's ever running the experiment is not able to distinguish between the effects of different factors. Okay, this is not an experimental design. Rather, it's an effect of poor design. So what you want to try to do is design your experiment so that if you have an outcome or an effect that's dependent upon a treatment, you want to make sure that that outcome is the result of the treatment and not the result of some external factor to your study. That would be what we call confounding. So try to plan your experiment so that confounding does not occur. Of course, there are different ways that we seek to control the effects of different variables. First, we employ what's called a completely randomized experimental design. This is where we randomly assign subjects to different treatment groups. So we're not <clears throat> assigning people to get a sugar pill or a real pill based on anything but randomized assignation. Then there's what's called randomized block design, where you form blocks. So you've got groups of subjects that are similar. And you assign treatment to random members in each block. So as you see in the graphic here, you've got white people and you've got orange people and you've got blue people you've got green people so these are different blocks 
or groups of subjects that are similar. And then within each of these blocks, you randomly assign people to take the treatment pill or the sugar pill. Then you have what's called matched pairs design, where you're comparing exactly two treatment groups using subjects matched in pairs that are somehow related or have similar characteristics. So a good example of matched pair design would be, yeah, you have two treatment groups, so you're giving a treatment to each group, but let's say the subjects are matched in pairs. So let's say that the, the pairing that we have is between, say, husband and wife. So you give the treatment to the husband, you give the treatment to the wife, and you compare the results from what you, what you administer to each of those participants. But they're paired together because they're both married to each other. So this is an example of matched pairs design. And then we also have what's called rigorously controlled design, which is where you carefully assign subjects to different treatment groups so that those given each treatment are similar in ways that are important to the experiment. So if, for example, the, the example a experiment that you're looking at is say, we want to affect the, we'll look at the effect of treatment on white people. So you're carefully assigning subjects to each of these different treatment groups to make sure that they're all from this white group here, okay? Or if you want to look at the effects on the orange group, you want to make sure that they're all uh, randomly selected from this orange group, okay? So that's a way it's important to the experiment. So now let's take a look at an example here of experimental design selection. So I'm going to give you an example, and you're going to tell me which type of experimental design is most appropriate. So first up we have uh, lisinopril is a drug used to lower blood pressure. In a clinical trial, blood pressure levels are measured before and after treatment with lisinopril. So what type of experimental design would be most appropriate here. I'll give you a few seconds to determine. Well, I hope you said match pairs design because that's what would be most treatment here. So what you want to do is you want to pair off someone who's uh, given the treatment, and so you've got you've got the before measurement that you take before you administer the treatment, and then for the same individual, you've got the after treatment. Okay, and the matched pair is the person before the treatment and the person after the treatment. And the reason why it's a matched pair is because those those two are actually one and the same person. So that's the relationship between the before and the after the two. Uh, examples that you're looking at. So that's what makes this match pairs design. Here's the next example. A clinical trial of aspirin treatments is being planned to determine whether the rate of heart attack is different for men and women. I'll give you a moment to determine what type of experimental design is most appropriate. Hope you said randomized block design because that's exactly what this is. Clinical trial of aspirin treatments, okay, you're going to determine whether the rate of heart attack is different for men and women. So you've got men forming one block, and then you've got women forming another block, and then from each of those blocks, you're going to randomly select, you know, a group, uh, you know, you know, a group of men and a group of women for each of those different blocks. This is randomized block design. Here's the next example. A clinical trial of a possible vaccine for the West Nile virus plans to include subjects given the vaccine and others given a placebo. So which type of experimental design is most appropriate here? Again, I'll give you a moment.
But I hope you said completely randomized design, because that's exactly what this is. So you're just taking a, a group of people and you're just randomly selecting, okay, you're going to get the vaccine or you're going to get a placebo. And it's just randomly selected. That's completely randomized design. Our last, our last example to look at here, the HIV Trials Network plans to conduct a study of two different treatments on 80 pairs of twins. For each pair, one receives one treatment and the other receives a different treatment. Which type of experimental design is most appropriate here? Again, I'll give you a moment. So here we have an example of matched pairs design. Okay, so you've got, you know, two different treatments that you're conducting on twins. So the twins makes us matched pairs because one's receiving one treatment and the other's receiving one treatment. And the connection between them is they're like identical copies of each other. It's what makes them twins. So this is an example of matched pairs design. Let's talk for a moment about experimental error. Okay, no matter how well you plan, we've talked about different ways to sample, different ways to design, but no matter how well you do that, okay, and execute on your sample collection process, you're going to have some error in your experiment or observational study. Sampling error is what we call the difference between a sample result and the true population result, okay? Remember, we're taking a sample from the population. And our conclusions from our statistical study have applicability to the wider population only in as much as the sample shares the same characteristics with the population. Well, you might be able to apply the results of your study if your sample has characteristics that are mostly the same as the population but yet not quite there and that part that's not quite there is what we call sampling error the difference between what we get from the sample and what we would get if we actually you know got data from every member of the population this is simply the result of chance fluctuations okay you're going to try to randomly pick people from the population for your sample. That, that's just good practice. But in that process, you're going to get fluctuations, okay? Because not every sample that you could randomly select is going to be exactly the same. Those fluctuations are going to produce sampling error. This is the most difficult uh, type of error to get rid of or minimize because it's just ingrained in the way things are so trying to reduce something you know that is just the way that it is that's really difficult to do now there are different types of sampling errors uh, the first type that we need to look at is non-sampling error and this occurs when sample data is incorrectly collected recorded or analyzed so you've got your data but you didn't collect it right, okay? Or you didn't record it right, okay? There was a transcription error because you're copying things over by hand from one point of data collection to another. Or yeah, there's a, a problem with the analysis somewhere. So an example would be uh, using a defective instrument, okay? The instrument was defective, and so it gave you a wrong measurement. Therefore, you collected the wrong data, okay? copying data incorrectly so you have surveyors who went out you know house to house and they filled out paper forms and now in order to conduct your uh, your your statistical analysis you want to use software to do it but computers don't do well with handwritten notes so you have to transcribe what's on the paper into the computer and there's a error that's made with the transcription these are examples of non-sampling error. Non-sampling error is easier to eliminate, okay, um, when you have fewer people accessing the data, okay. So, 
For example, if, if you're copying data as part of your process, the fewer people you have moving data manually from system to system, well, that's just going to make it easier to reduce the non-sampling error because there are fewer opportunities for that non-sampling error to occur. The other type of error is what we call non-random sampling error, and this results when a sampling method is not random. So we've looked before at convenient sampling and voluntary response sampling. These are examples of non-random sampling errors. And this is the easiest error to eliminate. You just use a different sampling method and boom, no more non-random sampling error. So this really is the easiest error to get rid of. And so in all of your experiments, understand you're always going to have some sampling error and you may have a little less non-sampling error. You should always try to get rid of that as much as you can. But there's really very little excuse for having any non-random sampling error in your experiment because it's really easy to get rid of. Just use a better sampling method. So in summary, when you're designing your experiments, remember these three very important considerations. First, you want to use randomization to assign your subjects to different groups. No matter what it is that you're looking at, whether it's an observational study or an experiment, you want to randomize the assignation of your subjects as much as possible. Second, you want to use replication when you're conducting an experiment. You want to repeat the experiment on enough subjects so that the effects of a treatment or other factors can be clearly seen. You want to be able to have enough people to show, yes, we're going to see the differences and the natural fluctuations that you get from small samples are minimized or eliminated. And then third, you want to control the effects of variables by using techniques like blinding and a completely randomized experimental design. Get rid of that chance occurrence as much as possible that the result you're going to get is what you're going to get. Get rid of that as much as possible by using these techniques and control the effects of your variables. And remember, always strive as much as possible to reduce the error in your experiment or observational study. That's all we have in this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, you know you can email me or come find me. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video or in class, whichever comes first. See you then.